Tom here from Lawrence Systems, and we're going to clear up some misconceptions like that you can stop a DDoS attack by putting Cloudflare in it. And I know that, but I don't know the next answer of exactly how you stop a DDoS attack. But this guy does, Ray Orsini. How you doing, Ray? Good, Tom. How you doing, man? So Ray is an expert, and he runs OIT VoIP and Ray is the reason my phones are ringing now, which makes me happy. But I was actually joking that it didn't make my staff completely happy. They're like, you know, we did kind of like it when phones didn't ring, but I did remind them if the phones don't ring, the checks probably won't cash either. So, you know, we sorted that out pretty quick. <laughs> Clients expect to reach you for some reason. For I, some I reason it. or another. So uh, this is kind of a follow-up. I did a video the other day on VoIP MS, just kind of explaining what we know about the situation. The only thing we know more about the situation a few days later, and today is uh, September 24th, 2021, is that it's still happening, which sucks. We don't have any inside information, but I did want to, you know, a lot of questions came up on that video, like how do we mitigate a DDoS attack and things like that? Um, so we thought we'd just clarify how that works, how some of it works. Ray's going to share his expertise on it. Um, but, you know, in full disclosure, we are a active customer of Ray's. We were using Ray before. I've been on his channel, Tech Bar, which by the way, I will leave it down below. And uh, some of Ray's staff has a problem with me because uh, he made them do some hot sauce. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was unfair. You had an unfair advantage. Yes. I was chewing, Sean was chewing, and you, you didn't tell us not to chew. That, yeah. that would have made all the difference. So if you're wondering about a hot sauce video, we'll, I'll leave a link to the tech bar I was on. Uh, and of course, you can find all the other tech bar episodes. It's a lot of fun uh, if you want to hang out with Ray and them, but uh, also the hot sauce video and things like that. So we've been working with Ray for a while. Uh, and Ray is a little bit different to what they offer at OIT VoIP. They are a full service, as I would call them, VoIP company, where they do full deployment and everything else. They aren't just a SIP company, uh, but they jumped in to help us because because, well, the situation sucks. And it's, you know, yeah, we're not trying to sucks. throw uh, VoIP MS under the bus or anything like that. We just don't know what's going on there uh, outside of, we know as much as you, the audience knows of whatever's been posted on Twitter. And we're not here to armchair it, but I thought I would do the clarification of exactly like how to mitigate it. And Ray was kind enough not only to come out here and talk about it, but go a step further and, uh, he used my favorite program, <laughs> Draw, and he drew <laughs> some cool graphs. So we'll talk about uh, that mitigation and clear things up related to that. It's uh, a little bit more in depth because when you take a mitigation from something like Cloudflare or put something on a high powered content delivery network when you're backing up a website well that's easy it's static content and if you know if my website was being attacked i could throw it up on cloudflare and replicate my website and my static content would be delivered but that doesn't really work with a voice phone call does it ray no not at all and that that's the problem with real-time communications because anytime you add anything else in the mix you have latency so while like voip ms now has cloudflare in front of the web portals and it'll ask you if you're a human and all that stuff you can't really do that with a phone call so it's right. much more complicated yeah, there's a there's a just a lot of confusion. It's because whenever you're managing real time applications, so from what you learn here today, you can also extrapolate this out to really any type of real type application service. A lot of these things apply uh, to it. If you have something that needs that back and forth communication, you can't just statically put something in front of it. We're going to keep it focused on VoIP because that's, uh, well, Ray's a longtime network engineer, but currently president of OIT VoIP. Uh, so there's a lot of where his expertise is, but he understands this deeply. I understand that it can't be done, but Ray's going to tell you how it can be done. So uh, where do you want to start, Ray? You want to start with the graph or do you just want to talk about some of the services? Um, no, I just I want to talk about like some of the ideas and the concepts that go beyond first before we get deep dive into the graph. Like, okay. And just some of my background, my background is in complex and distributed networking. That's what I've been building for 20 years. So multi-city, multi-site, multi-continent, those are the networks I've built my entire life. That's what I love doing. Um, but like you said, like when it comes to real-time applications, voice, uh, video, any time of that, you know, real-time messaging, that's much, much, much more complicated. And, you know, one of the reasons I was excited to get on a video with you is because there's so many misconceptions going on right now of like, and people asking questions, what can I do? What options? Why don't they just do this? Why don't they just do that? Right. And again, not, not just for MS. I want to be really clear. It's just like a breach. It's just like ransomware. It could happen to anyone. Right. This is just, they got hit. It, it really, you know, it's really unfortunate and our sympathies go out. Um, but with all the people that are affected and the questions they have, we want to go over 
what really happens the way uh, what really happens when the stuff happens and what what options are available to them yeah. um and I also I think, want to comment that a lot what, of this is referred to as yeah. mitigations. And that's, well, the reason that word's used as opposed to this solves the problem magically, which if anyone tells you that, just throw them out the door, march that salesperson yeah. right back out the door. Um, the Pure reason they well. use yeah. mitigation is because you're mitigating some of the problems, but you're not absolutely. If the pipe is big enough, you can get taken offline. I remember, I think it was Brian Krebs a couple of years ago. Uh, someone really hated him. and He was getting one of the largest DDoS ever attacked against a single individual. He said he set some records when they were trying to uh, mitigate it. And even though he had Cloudflare, Cloudflare, I think, passed him off to Google to avoid it. So um, any one of these, are, it is a scalability problem. And, and as more of these people won't patch stupid things on the Internet, uh, the botnets get bigger and more powerful. And toasters are well, going to be the destruction thing, right? of the Internet. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't we don't know the numbers behind uh, VoIP MS, VoIPMS, but right. um, you were bringing up the one for the UK, right? What was the number yep. you said for their throughput? Uh, 450 gigs. And I, that, I, that was quoted by uh, Steve Gibson on the last episode of Security Now, where he talked about the VoIP MS attack. In the previous episode, he had mentioned how big the Maris spotnet was. I don't know if those are coincidental things that... He announced one week the biggest spot network, of course, Bleeping Computer did as well. And then the next week we're talking about a large scale attack on different VoIP providers. And I I don't, you know, we don't know until the only people know who's on the receiving of this is the people receiving it. Um, but either way, these vo the, these botnets are dangerous and uh, they can yeah. knock companies offline, which is what brought us to this conversation. And, and that's the thing, right? Like when you're scaling out your, you know, purchasing a firewall and, you know, you're talking about throughput for your IDS, IPS and whatever other filtering you're doing, they have limits to what they can handle. And so when you think about, you know, that's a thing that comes up now in MSP world where, you know, you have multi gig available to you at a client site nowadays. It's not that uncommon, but go find a firewall that can actually filter in real time, that kind of throughput. Right. Now, when you say, even when you get a data center, you know, we may get a 10 gig, a couple 10 gig pipes or multiple, you know, or, or even a 40 gig. Um, most of the connections that most providers are using is 10 gig at 40 gig in a, in a good day. Um, so when you say 450 gigs of throughput, you got to imagine the kind of equipment required to just to be able to filter that. And that's where, that's what we'll get into on the diagram, which Keep in mind that kind of what's happening with the DDoS is it's just bombarding your equipment where it can't do anything because right. it's it's stuck, you know. Yeah, the so, mitigations are I, I would like, absorb it essentially. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so, and just like anything else, you know, when you have real time filtering, and if you do email filtering, for example, right, a lot of the email filter providers they receive the email first, they examine it, see what it is, and then if it passes their test, then they pass it over to you. That prevents, that presents latency, right? Whether the email gets to you a minute or two later, whatever it is, and that's the problem with VoIP. You can't really do that with VoIP because, you know, you can't, the conversation will be delayed and the user will notice. We have milliseconds to respond. Anything, to give you an idea, good VoIP is under 100 milliseconds, uh, or acceptable VoIP is under 100 milliseconds, good VoIP is under 30 milliseconds. So every little fraction of a second really makes a difference when you're talking to somebody. Um, but if you want to pull up the the uh, diagram, it says, first I want to go to go over how does VoIP actually work, right? Because like there's some, oh, yeah. there's some confusion there. <laughs> um, and so it, at, at its core, it's pretty simple. You have your phones and they'll register over to whatever VoIP provider you're using, right? And they may have multiple locations around the world and that kind of stuff that's pretty common and you're going to want to pick the one that's closest to you again to avoid that latency right and then they'll do their call processing and all that stuff all inside here and then when you're going to call somebody that's outside of their network right because on net if you're calling another customer on the same network it'll stay there but if you're going to call somebody that's you know calling a cell phone calling something like that that'll go over to what's called the public switch telephone network um the pstn is what we'll call it um and those connections, more often than not, are happening over the internet too, right? Most of the most of the CLEX, the competitive local exchange carriers, the people that actually own the phone numbers, um, they have internet. They're on the internet just like everybody else, and they may have private connections, public connections, but they're going to have their connections out to, uh, to these providers, and they're going over network resources. Uh, it's IP transit, just like anything else. Um, so. 
as you can imagine, every one of these uh, in the VoIP world, they're called switches or in the telco world, they're called switches. Um, a switch is something that's actually switching uh, calls from one resource to another, adding in applications like your auto tenant, your call queue, your music on hold. So these soft switches that are processing the calls, you're connecting to that over and of course you're going to have their routers or whatever they have here and then traffic's going to get there and they're going to do their job and send it off. No big deal. But what's happening is in the, with the DDoS attacks is you have all these other people doing the exact same thing, right? You have all these other agents sending traffic to the same routers, congesting the path and, you know, where they may have a couple one gig pipes, a couple 10 gig pipes or whatever it is, there's these guys, you know, would we'll take the UK for one because that's the only one we have the real numbers for. They're sending 450 gigs of traffic through. And even if that was split out to 45 gigs per pop or whatever you want to call it, it's saturating. The rest of your calls can't get through. Now, remember what I said, you have, it's that the carriers that are, you know, the public switch telephone network to get out to dial a cell phone, dial a, you know, somebody else's line on another phone provider. They're also using those same internet connections to the same soft switches. So if the call can't get, if you can't connect to it, they also can't connect to the PSTN. Now there's other strategies. I, I want to be clear. You can have private separate links, right? Like if you're building a SAN, you're going to have different net, uh, internet connections or different uh, network adapters for the data, separate for the storage, separate for the compute. You're going to have different things. And there are strategies like that for VoIP. I'm just talking about this general because I don't want to get really, you know, into the weeds yeah. on it. Um, but at the end of the day, it's this, it's these connections here, these giant traffic, uh, these giant blobs of traffic are just clogging the pipes for lack of a better word. And none of the traffic can get out. So when people start saying, well, can't they just forward my number? Well, how can they forward the number if the call switching, the call routing that happens here, they can't change anything because it can't send the traffic it needs out to the PSTN. If they can't say, okay, well, and what a common strategy would be is, you know, take this phone that's going over here to pop three, move them over to pop two. But if you saw Tom's last video where he brought up all the pops and, you know, those public IP yeah. addresses are very easy to find. It's not. And what's happening with the current attack is they're just rolling through the different pops and they're just, you know, they're taking one out and then they're moving to the next one and they're moving to the next one. So you may have good traffic going on at that point in time and an hour later you're sl you're slammed again you know yeah, it appeared I mean? to be it's, kind it's of like rough. a rolling attack across yeah. them where people say it's up it's down and uh, i'd seen people showing different plots and things like that it's kind of a maybe they don't have enough bandwidth to attack one because they have certain mitigation that can absorb x number of uh, connections per second but that's why they roll it now between different ones because you're still disrupting the service and um they probably do it based on time zone like you know they know that uh, these ones are more busy in the eastern time and these ones are more busy in pacific time uh whatever they can do to cause the most pain whoever's doing this that's their goal is to create pain well, and they're very smart about it, right? Like we saw that um, with the big, you know, MSP hack that happened uh, over Fourth of July weekend. They were planning to do it over the weekend because they knew it was going to, you know, people were going to yeah. be off. And nobody was going to be working that Monday or whatever it was. It just happened to go early, you know. And so these these attackers are very very smart, and, and I agree with you. I, I think they're looking at time zones. They're looking at the most active times. They're doing this. I, I and again. We don't have any insight. We haven't contacted yeah. any of them. It's pure speculative, but it is to me. It's clear this is being done to make to cause pain. This yep. is being done in the way that is the most destructive method possible. This is not a you know, oops, we we took over your your oil pipe by mistake. We really didn't mean to. My bad. This is a this is absolutely a directed attack. Um, and like I said, it could happen to anybody. Uh, you know what I mean? It's just you know, and, and that's what you you want to be careful with, but there's mitigation strategies, right? Like that's what the people really want to know that what can yeah. I do about this? Um, so with the mitigation strategies, as, as much as I'm, I'm sure Tom and I would like to get really, really, really technical about it. <laughs> it's not as complicated as you think. It is basically putting a referee in front. It's saying it's having the referee say, no, I'm going to scrub all the traffic and that's what they're called they're called scrubbers and they're these i should probably bring that up front um they're these giant big iron routers with these multi hundred gig or bigger connections 
aggregated with these ridiculously fast ASICs with the sole job of identify the traffic, filter out the bad traffic, let the good traffic pass. And so when it comes to the VoIP world, the common strategy is um, instead of having these, what are called pops, these points of presence, uh, whether it's the soft switch, whether it's their routers, whatever it is, instead of having them directly exposed to the clients, right, as we had here, um, the phone registers directly to the pop, what will happen here is the traffic will go through the scrubber and the scrubber will say, this is good traffic, this is bad traffic, it'll identify, it'll put stuff on RBLs, it'll black hole routes once it identifies, okay, well, IP 1.1.1.0, .1 .1 let me use a real IP address, <laughs> is, uh, is, we'll use is uh, one, 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 one. there we go. There, there you one, go, one, one, yeah. one. it's just DNS, <laughs> whatever. Yeah. Um, they can handle it, right? right. Um, so, but what'll happen is, okay, they'll identify, this traffic's coming in, it looks to be malicious, it's from this IP address. We've also seen the traffic from all these others because these are all ha working in tandem. And when I show 3M, these companies that do this, there's really big companies that do this. There's uh, Arbor, we talked about, NetScout yep. owns them, uh, Path.net, Carrero, They're, Cloudflare is the biggest, most common one. Now, Cloudflare doesn't do VoIP, that's why we're not talking about it in this context. But these giant, enormous scrubbers, they're talking to each other as well. So there's this orchestration that says, okay, well, scrubber one identified traffic from here that's bad. Let me take that same IP list or let me take that same ASN or let me take that same prefix. And I'm now going to tell scrubber three or scrubber two, give them the data so they can also proactively block it. And they get faster and faster and faster. And that learning period and that scrubbing period, that's why we call it mitigation. We can't yep. do this all the time. Um, because now imagine you're passing traffic over to the scrubber, then over to your VoIP network. And the reason VoIP providers like myself have so many of these pops is we want to be as close to you as possible. And anytime you introduce an extra data center, an extra hop, you're going to introduce some latency and, you know, the potential for any kind of route congestion, any kind of anything else that could happen. Um, but what happens is, you know, these things are ridiculously good at what they do, especially the ones that are designed for VoIP. They'll scrub the traffic, and instead of having these devices, these soft switches on the public internet, will have GRE tunnels, typically. Um, GRE tunnels, which is basically, it's an encapsulation thing. Yeah. It's basically like VPN, but different. Um, but yeah. we'll establish I'm going to do a GRE video tunnels. separate on GRE, because a few people asked about it. I, I want to do a video on it, because yeah. there's some good use cases for it, like this. Oh, Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Right. Um, doesn't provide the encryption, but it does provide the encapsulation. Yes. And a lot of times you can combine IPsec with Jerry, but that's a whole, that's a different, uh, I'm looking forward to that video. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, so we'll have established Jerry tunnels. And so what will happen, we may be hitting that 450 over here, but all that's really being passed over here is the good traffic. So maybe that 10 gig or that one gig or five gigs or whatever is coming through. And then they're able to go out to the PSTN. And they may have a private connection back to it, uh, to the PSTN carriers, or they may have another GRE connection, or even if they're just going back out to the scrubber to go back out to the PSTN, not a big deal because the scrubber is cleaning all the work for you. Um, it's your security guard and it, it makes life a lot easier. Um, I hope that was as clear <laughs> as no, clear I, as mud. <laughs> it, you know what? I think it makes a lot of sense. You know, the data coming in. And the other thing too is uh, as you do this, the learning period that these go through uh, and they build these blacklists, like how they are identifying things, as I mentioned earlier, like the Maris botnet, um, those are a bunch of uh, specifically MikroTik devices that make up that particular botnet. And the goal is to collect all those uh, addresses because these are usually solved on static addresses. And these are fairly powerful devices. The MikroTik have a relatively good processor, so it allows them a lot of attack. And as you said, the collectors are doing all the collection and burning that. So once those uh, things have collected and learned all the bad IP addresses, the only thing left is the good IP addresses coming from clients. Now, hopefully they're not one and the same. Hopefully the client's not part of the botnet, but I bet that happens. And that's hopefully. probably fun. <laughs> they're like, hey, by the way, you're I'm sitting sure behind happened once or twice. <laughs> yeah. You're sitting yeah. behind one of these infected devices that's doing the attacking. That's a weird coincidence. <laughs> Right, but yeah, and then you get that email from your ISP saying, "Hey, we noticed you have port twenty five open and sending traffic, or you're doing a yeah. DNS reflection." Yeah, <laughs> bad stuff. And and what happens with the clients? I, I thought I should bring this up real quick. Um, what happens with the clients? The reason all this can happen in the background, the clients actually don't have to worry about registering to a new place, 
is because, and this is where you have to have some preparation. Uh, yeah. This is not just something you can do on the fly. Um, you know, VoIP providers such as myself, we do plan this stuff out just like, you know, whether it's an IR strategy for anything else, you have to have your plans for this. And what will happen is we will have, we will use BGP and um, these scrubbers or these DDoS mitigations will start announcing our prefixes. So when you go and you resolve pop1.voip.network, what will happen is instead of resolving over here, it'll resolve to an IP address. Uh, and that IP address, instead of routing over here, it'll route over here. That way they're getting the traffic. We're not telling the user, hey, now you need to re register to POP2 instead or POP3. It's completely transparent to the user. Um, yeah. And that's just built into the way the internet works. Thank you, BGP, and, <laughs> and yes. all that fun stuff. Yeah, and essentially what's going on here is you can slide these in with a BGP route announcement. So you you prepared this. You know what the route announcement is to put these in. You know what the route announcement is to take them out. And as you said in the beginning, to keep the voice latency at the absolute optimal, which VoIP is uh, kind of unique in this. When you're thinking about your presence, uh, VoIP always has to have almost like a city level. Wherever they have a lot of customers, you end up with one of your points of presence being there to keep the latency at the absolute lowest. And you don't leave this turned on all the time because once again, you want to keep the latency at the absolute lowest, but this is really where the planning comes in phase to make sure that, well, we see it happening, guys, flip the switch and do a BGP route announcement. If you dig around on my channel, um, I covered the Verizon. Do you remember the Verizon Pittsburgh uh, incident? Oh, with BGP? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I covered how that happened and cover a little bit of how BGP route announcements go wrong. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, and it happens too all the time where like somebody else will announce the wrong route or, you know, when you're announcing, you're announcing routes, they may announce a prefix that didn't belong to them. Yeah. And so stuff will start getting routed through Croatia or through whatever else. Yeah. Um, and it, it's that's crazy happening that less and less, happen. but yes, it can. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We could get a whole, a whole other topic and I could bring some more people. We should have like a BGP round table would be fun. Cause I have some friends. Oh, that'd be stories. Fun. <laughs> <laughs> I've learned a lot from them, man. I'm not, I don't even, I'm not the BGP expert, but I, from talking to them, they're pulling their hair on a regular basis. Um, but nonetheless, it's gotten much better than it was a couple of years ago. And once you have this in place, you flip the switch, the BGP route announcement, about how long did they take from, from, I see something going on and you flip the switch. What's the time frame we're looking at, Ray, from uh, these not installed so, to putting these in? So the announcements, you can do them as quick as, as 60 seconds. Um, it, it is very, very fast as long as you have everything prepared in advance. Right. Um, they need to know where your IP or what your prefixes are, which your subnets, they need to know what you have. Um, they need to know uh, who you're peering with. Um, they need to know what the acceptable traffic is, what the data centers are using. You have to have the GRE tunnels ready to go. Um, those GRE tunnels typically stay live 24-7. Um, the difference is we're just not routing traffic through them until something bad happens. Um, and this is not really different from what, how an ISP handles things either. It's not uncommon for them to take an, uh, take an, a subnet and instead of announcing it in their Cleveland data center, they'll announce it in their, you know, Dayton data center. It happens very, very often. Um, the difference is with VoIP, we don't move things around nearly as often just because, you know, we, we want things to stay nice and stable. And it's, you know, yeah. if your Google.com takes a little longer to refresh, <laughs> you're not going to notice. Right. Um, if your phone call gets choppy, you are absolutely going to notice and we're going to get a phone call or a nasty email or something. Yeah, so exactly. All right. So we got this part covered. Now what's next? So one of the things that... Um, I kept seeing online, right? And, and I know we talked about this, both of us kept seeing this is, well, why can't I, I'm just going to get a backup SIP provider, right? I'm just going to get a backup VoIP provider. Right. That way I, I don't lose my phone calls, <laughs> which, okay, this is one of those things that maybe, right? It, it And it doesn't really work that way because what will happen is just like, um, and I don't, I don't want to get super deep dive into this, but just like IP addresses have their BGP routes that are, which are how you find the, the IP addresses. And just like DNS, you'll look for DNS and DNS will resolve IP addresses. DIDs, phone numbers, right? And, and the North America numbering plan is 10 digits, right? Area code, uh, exchange, and then the last four. Right. Um, so what will happen is those phone numbers have what's called an LRN, uh, uh, it's a routing number and they, and when you look for, I'm going to call Tom and you know, one, 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 um, what's going to happen is we'll do a lookup and we'll say, okay, well, what rate center does that belong to? It equates to this LRN belongs to this rate center. This rate center is currently pointed to Verizon. Let's call it right. Um, 
So, and then Verizon being the SIP provider for you will send the call to you. Um, you cannot move that number. You can't say, okay, this number is now going to be on, you know, Bob's telco without a porting process where that we basically it's telling the LRN to now point to Bob's telco instead of Verizon. So when you go through porting, you're moving carriers. That's what happens. Um, if you had a second VoIP provider, say you had Verizon and you had Bob's telco, you can't get your phone number to just magically come through Bob's telco. If Bob, if Verizon's getting slammed, that number is not going to work. You can get a second SIP provider for doing outbound. Right. That's not a big deal. You can absolutely send the call out. That's not going to help you with people trying to get a hold of you. So if you wanted to say, hey, this is my temp number, you know, call me on this number. We can still receive to the office. You could do that. It's not much better than just saying, here's my cell phone number, <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? which <laughs> honestly, it's what I would do. Um and now I'm only saying that that's only for local phone numbers. Um, so um, toll-free numbers are a little bit different. Toll-free numbers are a lot like BGP, a lot like um, DNS. And that toll-free, you can actually modify uh, modify their route every five minutes, um, which is why, you know, we got very lucky when we were helping you guys out and, and moving your numbers. We happen to have a lot of the relationships on the back end with the same underlying carriers. So we were able to move the numbers the same day. Um, but with toll-free, that's always the case. Toll-free, you can move it like that. That's actually one of the benefits of toll-free, why it's sold to enterprises, is because they can load balance calls on toll-free and they can actually migrate them to where it's most cost advantageous for them or where it's more advantageous for them because of any kind of provider outage or anything like that. It's actually one of the really cool things about toll-free. It's one of the reasons we liked it. I, years ago, when I worked in uh, enterprise, with, that's a, one of the reasons we set up the toll-free was because uh, we had some call capacity issues that we run into, and that's how we would mitigate those and solve them. <laughs> yeah, it's it's weird because DIDs, local numbers, right? DIDs, direct inward dial, but it's the common name for local numbers. Um, they'll be tied to one provider. With toll-free numbers, especially in the enterprise space and the marketing, uh, when you're in the marketing and sales space, it's not uncommon for a toll-free number to hit multiple carriers at the same time. Um, that it's actually pretty typical. Um, it's one of the things a lot of people don't realize when you call out. Um, we're actually trying multiple underlying carriers. We're doing real-time calculations. What is our lowest cost route? What is the route that's going to have the least amount of um, the least amount of hops, or that's going to get the fastest connection? And so, like when you make a call and you hear it's a little bit quiet before it starts ringing, that's called post-dial delay. That's what the carrier is doing on the back end when they're seeing what's the best route to get there. Um, and toll free, you just have a lot more magic you can do. It's just uh, a lot easier. <laughs> that is cool. All right. Do we cover all of it? Is there, or is there something else we want to throw in here? Uh, let's see here. We talked about DDoS. We talked about um, voice applications. Uh, we talked about real time. Uh, we talked about second providers, um, toll free. Uh, porting out, um, that is okay. I, I want to be really cautious about this, about ah. how I pre preface this because a lot of the providers thought Mike, and I'm, I, I have to say VoIP MS here and I'm not calling them out. I want to be yeah. clear on it. But a lot of the people that I saw on the Twitter feeds were saying, I can't even port out because their services are down. That's absolutely not true. Now I'm, I want to be clear. I'm not saying when your carrier has a problem, jump right, jump ship right away. No. In most cases, porting out takes a couple of days or a couple of weeks. So, you know, there's a negative return and they may fix it. So I'm not trying to get anybody scared and saying you should port out immediately. But the way porting works is there's a central repository. Um, MPAC is the one that's responsible for the phone numbers and the phone number routing. When you say, you know, I want my numbers to be on Tom's telco or Bob's telco. And so that company is completely outside of uh, VoIP MS or anybody else. Um, so that porting process does still work. Now you may need a copy of your bill, which if you can't log in the portal ugh, or you can't get a pin number or your, you know, that stuff is fine. Um, even if they're so jammed up that they can't respond to because there is a timeline they have to respond to port out requests with the way the FCC has, has set it up. They don't get a pass to not respond to port out requests because they're having a DDoS attack. That's right. not the way that works. The FCC <laughs> truly and honestly doesn't care. Yeah. Um, so they do have their timelines. They have to respond. Most scenario, in most cases, if they don't respond, the number is going to port out automatically no matter what. Um, so if you're in a position, and again, I want to be extremely clear. I'm not saying telling everybody on VoIP a message jump ship. It could happen to anybody. Right. I'm sure they're working night and day to get it resolved. That's not what I'm saying here. 
but so you know what's available to you, regardless of what, whatever incident happens, you always have the ability to port out no matter what. Um, cause I, I saw that come up over and over again and you know, yeah, people were, it, it's more about talking about that process and making sure people are clear that you can do that. And this is actually one of those questions that's come up before. Um, and once again, because I, I did some, um, I, my first phone system I worked on was in 99 on Nortel systems and things like that. But so I, <laughs> they're probably still running. I <laughs> I mean, yeah, they, they, they never die, <laughs> but, um, yeah, they turn so yellow, but they don't die. <laughs> it's all they do is kind of a bit that weird yellow patina. <laughs> <laughs> but they uh nonetheless the one thing that is come up for is like well what if you're with this company and they go defunct or whatever and you can still get your number back out because that's actually happened over the years um maybe one day me and ray will talk about some more stories and i have a crazy one about being involved in a voice company around circa 2005 one of the big VoIP companies that started up and fell apart because of some funding problems but anyways you can get all your numbers back out of it um it kind of it, it defaults let's say that company any company um just doesn't respond for reasons unknown. Eventually, the, it's kind of like fail over to the inbound porting where the request came from. Correct. So that's right. how it works. The yeah the the local number porting act, uh, local portability act, local number portability act. I'm sorry, you're gonna have to edit that. <laughs> <laughs> we, we were doing our best to not have to edit anything. Yeah. Um, the the local number portability act is very clear. In most cases, there are very few. There are a handful of exceptions. But in most cases, the user of the phone number has the right to move it anywhere else they want. I'm not saying they are the owner of the number. The right. owner of the number is a whole different thing. That belongs to the rate center. That belongs to the SPID. That's assigned by, by NPAC. But the user of the number has the right to move it however they want to wherever they want. And in most cases, as long as there's, you know, it's not some ultra rural telco that doesn't have SS, SS7 interchange or whatever, um, in most cases, they can migrate the number and it's not a big deal. Um, so you always have that available to you. Yep. So hopefully this cleared up all the questions. And now this will be the video I reply with for all the uh, Cloudflare people that just say, did you use Cloudflare? <laughs> Which drives me nuts. <laughs> it's an oversimplification of a very complicated problem. <laughs> you see or how Cloudflare many... will respond back on Twitter and they'll say, now we have VoIP service. So... Yeah, yeah and, and make this whole video wrong because they'll, they'll, they could do the same thing. Right. But all these complicated lines, this shows the complexity of it. That's why you can't just say use Cloudflare. There's a little bit more to it than that. And that's what we wanted to share with you. Um, that's why I have Ray on here. Uh, but me and Ray are probably going to do some future videos together as well. But I, I'll leave Definitely. all the links to uh, OIT VoIP and uh, me eating hot sauce array and suffering a little. And <laughs> poor Simon. <laughs> I, I have gone back and, uh, and had a few more pieces uh, with my family. Obviously, there was, you know, it, it was at a family event and there was good drinking involved to to build up the courage to have that again. Uh, we're not at Tom level where you can just, I don't know how you pound it down, man. It, it is impressive. So. <laughs> On this little memory card is the one chip challenge. I have to edit that still. We did it here at the office. I don't recommend it. We we ended up employees like we had to clear the calendar. It was bad. It was rough for us. I was watching a TikTok where they were talking about how to make your own chip uh, seasoning and stuff like that. So when are we going to see like Tom's like fiery chip <laughs> sauce or like, you know what I mean? Like, when are we going to see your kettle chips? Like, uh, uh, I can only imagine how bad that would be. At some point we may, we may go there, but <laughs> it's uh, nonetheless. All right. Links down below to some of the things I referenced, like, uh, of course, everything that Ray did. And uh, if you want to listen to that GRC episode uh, by Steve Gibson, he covers it. And um, some of the other bleeping computer articles I mentioned, I try to make sure we cite all the sources where we have this information from. There's always more reading to do. I don't want you just to watch this video and say, this is it. There's always more. And it's a rabbit hole. And we've read all these articles to get to where we are so we can share the knowledge of you. And uh, thank you all for joining us here. And uh, thank you, Ray, for coming on and helping us out here. And big thanks because my phone's ringing again. <laughs> yeah. You're welcome. And I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. no, thanks for having me on Tom. Cause they ring a fun, lot. Man. When, once you fix it, man, we were like, Oh crap. <laughs> Just ding, ding, ding. <laughs> I, I would like to know how was that first person, that first phone call you answered? Like, were they like surprised that the phone was ringing? Like how excited were they? Like they won the lottery, right? I answered some of them because they were ringing so much. You know, I was like, I guess I got to help now. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good, man. Well, until the next one. <laughs> yep. All right. Thanks. And thank you for making it to the end of this video. If you enjoyed this content, please give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more content from this channel, hit the subscribe button and the bell icon. 
To hire a Sure project, head over to lawrencesystems.com and click on the Hire Us button right at the top. To help this channel out in other ways, there's a Join button here for YouTube and a Patreon page where your support is greatly appreciated. For deals, discounts, and offers, check out our affiliate links in the descriptions of all of our videos, including a link to our shirt store where we have a wide variety of shirts and new designs come out, well, randomly, so check back frequently. And finally, our forums. Forums.lawrencesystems.com is where you can have a more in-depth discussion about this video and other tech topics covered on this channel. Thank you again, and we look forward to hearing from you. In the meantime, check out some of our other videos.